Well, would you open your copy of the Word of God, please, to the book of John, John chapter 6. John chapter 6, and I'm going to, I hope I'm not going to be too clumsy tonight with, with this Bible. I, it's a different Bible than I normally use. The one that I normally use, that New American Standard, mine is getting pretty rickety and some pages are trying to come out of it. I've been using it for so long and I want to try. I've got several other copies of the Word and I want to just try out some and see uh, see what I, I like using the best. This is a New International Version that I've had for a long, long time and it's still stiff. It's been in a box for a long time, so it's not easy to turn the pages on it. So, uh, John chapter 6, and I want us to look at a familiar passage, one that we have looked at before, but maybe tonight we'll look at it in a little different way and, and have a, uh, an impact on us, a very special word for us, because uh, I want us to think tonight about, about how to face problems. And uh, friends, uh, we, we know that... Uh, it's not all rosy in this life, amen? I mean, it is not always downhill and shady. Sometimes we face problems. We face difficulties in life. We have bad days. Do you ever have a bad day? I mean, a bad day. Have you ever had a bad day? <laughs> Every day. So if it one for bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. And it just seemed like there are bad days. But you know how to tell when you've had a bad day? You can tell you're having a bad day when you call your answering service and they tell you to mind your own business. <laughs> you, can, you can tell you're having a bad day when, you're, when you sink your teeth into a juicy steak and they stay there. You can tell you're having a bad day when that happens. You can tell you're having a bad day when you put your pants on backwards and they fit better. <laughs> you, can tell, you can tell you're having a bad day when your horn gets stuck on your car while you're waiting for a light behind Hell's Angels. Now, now you know you're having a bad day when any of those things or all those things happen to you. But we need to know... <laughs> we need to know how to handle the bad days right along with the good days, don't we? Well, let's, let's look at uh, an eyewitness account here of Jesus and the disciples. And from the disciples' point of view, and especially this one particular disciple named Philip, this was a bad day. A bad day. Let's stand together as we look at a few verses here together. Jesus has been teaching... And it says in verse 5, When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will that go among so many? And Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. And Jesus then took the loaves and gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets. Underline that. Twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw this miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again into the hills by himself. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you so much that even when we have a bad day, that uh, those bad days can be turned from opposition into opportunity when we look to Jesus. And Father, we thank you that, 
that we have, the promises of Your Word to stand on. And help us tonight, Lord, as we think about this, that we might be, that we might be all, not only supported by the Word, but we might be encouraged and thrilled by all that You have for us tonight. Teach us Your way and Your Word. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Would you be seated, please? <clears throat> Now, to Philip, this was a bad day. I mean, here were these thousands of people, and it says in the Word, we just read it together in this eyewitness account, it says there that there were 5,000 men. It didn't say 5,000 people, it said 5,000 men. That means they didn't count the women and the children. And if your observation is what mine has been down through the years, usually when you gather some people together, in the name of Jesus, you've got more women there than you do men. And so not only did they have 5,000 men, they had at least that many more women and then also children on top of that. And so when Jesus turned to Philip and he put the question to him, asking him, well, now how are we going to feed all this great multitude? Well, Philip kind of got weak in the knees, didn't he? He sort of got weak in the knees because he looked out at all that great crowd and he, he whipped out his calculator and he did a few fast calculations on that, that calculator that he had in his robe and, and he said, Lord, we can't do it. I mean, I mean, just any way you cut it here, when you figure all this thing out and this equation I've got here in my calculator, well, well it, would, it would take eight months' wages just to buy a, ba a bite for each one of them. And so there Philip was, and the Lord had put that question to him, and he was, he was seeing everything just the way we talked about this morning, the way you and I see things so often, and that he, is that he was seeing things from a human point of view. Now the first thing that I want us to get from this passage tonight is this, that when we're having a bad day, when we're faced with a challenge before us, when we're faced with something that we just can't understand, how in the world we're going to get through it, how we're going to make ends meet, how we're going to make all this come together. First of all, let's, let's get this down. Never face your problems in light of your own resources. The child of God is not left to only His resources. The child of God is left to God's resources. And just like the little equation we worked at this morning with Simon Peter trying to walk on the water, friend, listen, we can always bring the power of God into the equation when, we're trying, when we are facing something that we just don't know exactly how we're going to get through it. Now, I want to tell you something. Before we meet here again, this is Sunday night, and before we get back together again, maybe Wednesday night, maybe next Sunday, before we meet again, somebody, somebody here tonight is going to face something they're not... Going to, they're going to think, I can't do this. You're going to face something. It might be a financial problem. It may be a family problem. It may be a physical problem. Something that you're going to face. And in your human resources, there's not going to be an answer. When you face those kind of problems, when you face those things, remember, we never face our problems in light of our own resources only. We have a blank check from God. I'm not talking about being, I'm not talking about being ridiculous. I'm not talking about being uh, squirrely and crazy and out of your mind about the. I'm just talking about realizing that we're children of God. We're King's kids, and we're to live in a in a in a manner like like God would have us to live. We're to be cautious and and we're to be uh, careful about the decisions that we make in life. And, and we're not to, to lean on our own understanding, the Bible says, but it doesn't say we're not to use our understanding. And, and if, if God doesn't want us to use our understanding, then the whole book of Proverbs and several other books could be taken out of the Bible. God intends for us to be good stewards and to use our minds and to, to try to, to uh, do things in a, in a good, orderly way. But, but we bring God into the equation. We step out by faith. Oh, man. It's like a, like a little boy was, was struggling with a great big old stone that was in the yard. And he was trying with all, that he could, all the strength he had to move that stone. He went and got a stick and he put the stick in the ground trying to get some leverage on that stone. And he broke the stick and he pushed and he pushed. And he just got so exhausted he sat down beside the stone and just started to bawling because he couldn't move that stone. And daddy had been standing up there on the porch watching him. 
And he walked out there and he said, Son, what are you trying to do? He said, Dad, I'm trying to move this old stone. He said, Well, can you move it? He said, No, I've tried everything I know how to do. And I can't move this stone. And his dad said, Son, you haven't asked for my strength to help you. <laughs> and the father got down, the little boy got down, and they moved that stone so easily. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're just like that little boy. We're just like, I'm, I'm like that. I don't know about you, but yeah, I do know about you too. But that's just the way we are, isn't it? We, we just use everything we can think of. We struggle, we struggle. And all the time, God's just standing there thinking, well, maybe when old Wayne exhausts himself, he'll turn around and ask for me to help him. Just think about that sometime. The next time you're just exhausted trying to move that old stone and, and you're about to squall over it and you don't know what to do, won't you just turn around and ask the Father to help you with it? Because you see, a child of God, we can figure the power of God into the equation when we step out in faith and do the things for God. You remember old Moses? <laughs> you remember him, the pastor of the First Baptist Church of the Wilderness? <laughs> After what we've been through, I think I'm the second. But anyway, he was the first pastor of that church. <laughs> And he had all kinds of trouble. And right off the bat, they came to the Red Sea and they had too much water. Remember what God told him to do just to stretch out that rod? Remember that old rod that Moses carried? That was just an old shepherd's rod, wasn't it? You remember the story of that rod? How when, when Moses met God up on the mountain and God told him to take that rod that was in his hand and cast it down? You remember that story? <laughs> and he's cast it down the ground. It turned into a snake. And God said, now Moses, reach and take it by the tail. And Moses was already gone. You know, it said he ran. And so God said, Moses! <laughs> he said, come back and take up that rod by the tail. Take up that snake by the tail. And Moses said, we don't do it that way here, Lord. <laughs> but he finally, in faith, reached down and picked up that snake by the tail. It turned back into a rod. But this time, and from then on, it would no longer be just an old shepherd's rod. Now it would be the rod of God. And when he stretched it out over that Red Sea, the Red Sea opened. And instead of having too much water, they had dry land to walk through. Another time he used that rod was in the wilderness. And there was, he had a no water situation. And remember, he went down that first time and he struck the rock according to the instruction of the Lord. And they had water. They had water. You see, uh, Moses in his own power could not have separated that Red Sea. Moses in his own power could not have struck a rock and bring water out of it. But you see, there's an equation in there. There's an equation of the God factor that goes in to that equation that we ought to see as our, as our privilege too. Not to see things, not to see our problems in light of our own resources, but to see our problems in light of God's resources. You remember that prostitute that came to Jesus that time and, and uh, all she had was just a, a little box of, of ointment. Remember that? That's all she had to give to the Lord. But she took that little box of ointment and she broke it, remember? And she poured it out. And, and old Judas, and you know, he, he grumbled about that. They should, she shouldn't, shouldn't have done that, he said. We could have taken that and sold it and given the money to the poor. He just wanted to get his hands on the money, didn't he? But see, she took what little bit she had. You know, she is just like a, a repeat. And Moses is like a repeat of this, this same story. It all seems to flow along the same way because you see the point of this is that when they looked around at the resources they had, all they had was a little lunchbox that a, a little fella had brought. It says that he had just a, some barley, loaves, and some fish. Now, now think about this with me. Think about this. And some of you have studied this in Sunday school and you've, you've gone through this, but maybe, maybe you need a refresher in it. Maybe you haven't really thought about this. Some of you hadn't really thought about it. When we think about this, and when you've seen this depicted in, on the screen, maybe in a, or a video or something like that, they usually, you know, they got these big old loaves of bread. They start ripping up these big old loaves. Man, this was a little boy's lunch. <laughs> Do you send your little boy off to school with a big old loaf of bread like that? Well, no. You send him off with what's appropriate for a little boy to eat. He had five small barley loaves and two small fish. These barley loaves, as a matter of fact, a barley loaf was the cheapest kind of bread. It was about to become Wonder Bread. But uh, when his mother sent him off with it, it was barley bread. And it was just about like some little tortillas, what we would think of as tortillas. Just little old bitty flat pieces of, of bread. Just something to wrap 
and to eat up with those fish. And a couple little old fish, and these this word here for fish is little fish, is about the size of sardines. Here was a here was a boy that had had five tortillas and two sardines with him. I mean, I mean that didn't even sound good. <laughs> But, but that's all he had. And here's the key to it. If you don't get anything else out of what we're going to say tonight, get this. It wasn't the amount of what he had. It was the fact that he gave what he had. That is a message in itself. And if we stopped right here, now don't smile, we're not stopping right here. But if we stop right here, that would be enough for us. Do you realize that? Don't concentrate on the little bit that you have. Give what you've got. We say, well, we ought to give 10%. No, friend, listen. If you want to really be blessed, give 100%. Give yourself to God. Give your family to God. Give all your resources to God. Just transfer title over to God on everything that you have if you want to really find happiness. It doesn't matter if what you have is just a small amount. Hey, remember that widow with, with the, the widow's mite? Remember that? You remember that story? Boy, and, and there the, the offering plate was and people were going around and those Pharisees would come and they'd put a big old coin and they'd spin it around in that pot so it would make a lot of racket and everybody would stand back and say, my, my, look what he gave. And that poor little widow came. What would she give? That's right. I, I bet most of us in here wouldn't bend over for a penny. If you saw a penny in the parking lot, I bet most of you wouldn't. I would. I, I bend over when I see. That's right. I get down and I get a hold of that penny. But uh, most people wouldn't, wouldn't even wouldn't even go through the effort of bending over to pick up a penny nowadays. And she just gave a couple of little old mites. And you know what the Lord said? Standing back over there watching. By the way, when that offering plate goes by, just imagine Jesus is standing by over here somewhere watching. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's his birthday, by the way. But it <laughs> and he was standing back watching what everybody gave. And what did he say about her gift? He said she gave what? More. More than everybody else. Why? Because she gave everything she had. When that little boy gave up that little lunchbox, he, get, he didn't give much, did he? But he gave what? He gave all that he had. And friend, listen, we give it all that we've got for God. When we give it all that we've got, we have every reason to figure in the power of God in the equation. Man, this year ahead, 1994, look at, we got to build some buildings here. We got, we got to add on. That's just it. We've been, we, we'll be here four years in April. Well, it's time to add on permanent structure. How are we going to do it? Can't do it. <laughs> Figure it out on my calculator. Can't be done. Oh, wait a minute. Forgot to put the God factor in. We'll do it. We'll do it because God wants it done. So when we're figuring, when you're facing those problems, you're facing those problems, don't face your problems in the light of your resources only. There's something else about this lesson that uh, I want you to see with me too in, uh, in John 6. As, as he feeds that multitude, that great crowd of people, and then uh, let, let's skip over the part across, about going across the water right now. We'll come back to that. But then they, they go over to the other side and this great crowd follows them over there. Because why? Oh, because they were spiritual. They wanted to hear more about what Jesus had to say. Oh, no. They went over there because they wanted more bread. They want another free lunch is what they were after. That's why they followed him over there. And he knew exactly why they came and followed him over there. So they could get that free meal. But look, look at what he tells them when we look on in the latter part of chapter 6 there. He tells them, he says, you came because, uh, because of the bread. You didn't come because of, of the things that, uh, of the Lord. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that man shall not live by bread alone, doesn't it? But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then he goes on to tell, tell them one of the most difficult teachings of his whole ministry, and that was that he was the bread of life. And if you were to have life, you had to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And when he said that, even some of the, the people that were following him the closest turned away and didn't follow him anymore. But what he had to say was so significant that he even turned to those disciples, those men that were the closest to him, and he said, are you going to go away too? 
I mean, he was ready to lose the whole crowd over this. But what was he really talking about? He was not talking about his physical body, his physical flesh. In verse 63, he says, The flesh gives life. The flesh count, The spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. So let me just add this to what we're talking about tonight. Not only should we... When we face a problem, not face it in light of our, our resources only, but when we face a problem, we should also look for the spiritual side to that problem and not just the physical or material side to it. You see, so many things that happen to us. I mean, life, you know, we're, we're living a physical existence, a material existence here. And so the things that happen to us come at us that way. But friend, listen, I heard a preacher say one time, and I think this is right, that every problem, in essence, is a spiritual problem. Somewhere back there, somewhere in that problem that we're facing, there's a spiritual seed to that physical or financial or material problem that we're facing. And so we need to try to understand that, that, that that's part of what we need to see the spiritual side to this thing and not just the, the physical side to it. need to realize that, that God is trying to teach us something. Now, folk, I believe this with all my heart. There's not anything, anything, anything that comes into your life, child of God, that God hasn't ordained, that God hasn't caused to happen, or God hasn't allowed to happen. I believe that with all my heart. We're going to talk about that some more in just a minute, but, but that's the way it is. And so when God allows something in our lives, we ought to try to see the spiritual side of it and let God give us the spiritual sight to understand what it is that He's trying to show us. You know, I heard about, uh, I heard about an incident at Mid-America Seminary that happened uh, some, some time back a year or two ago. I wanted to share with you tonight, but this, this professor at Mid-America Seminary in Memphis was on a trip, and, and when he was getting his baggage in, in, uh, in, in the airport, he got his baggage, he went back over and he picked his coat up. And when he picked up his coat, there were two rolls of money under his coat. There was two rolls wrapped up in rubber bands. And he began to unroll it. There was $10,000 in one of those rolls and $10,000 in the other roll. <laughs> and he thought, what should I do? And he thought, well, maybe I better go to the office and tell him what happened. He went to the office and he turned in those that $20,000. And while he was still in the office, a young man rushed in. He said, I left some money. I lost some money in the airport. And they said, well, can you describe it? He said, it was two rolls of $10,000 with a rubber band around each one. And they said, well, obviously this is your money. Then they gave him money. He walked out without even saying thank you. And that professor... Walked on out of the airport, got in the cab, go to his hotel, and the old devil got in the cab with him. <laughs> and the old devil began to say to him, look at that. That young man, he didn't even say thank you. He didn't even say thank you. Why, you could have kept that money. You could have given that money to the seminary. You know the seminary needs money. $20,000, think of that. What $20,000 would have meant to that seminary? And then he thought, I could have kept 10% finder's fee and given the rest of the seminary. I told you he's a preacher. <laughs> and he was sitting back there just fuming over that money that he had just had in his hand, just slipped through, through his hand. And he was just fuming over it. Satan just had him all wrapped up. And he finally realized that Satan was the one that was dealing with him and the Lord just seemed to speak to him and say, don't concentrate on what you don't have. Think about what you do have. And he got to thinking about all that he had and the Lord said to him, you are rich in me. And he started thinking about all that he had in the Lord. He had salvation and maybe that fellow that came in and got that money, maybe he was a drug dealer and, and who knows what kind of horrible life the poor guy lived. And, and here I'm rich in the Lord. Why am I so down in the dumps? And why am I feeling so bad about this? And he was getting, getting close to having a fit in the back of that taxi. He said, just think of all that I have. And he said it out loud. And the taxi driver said, give me all, thought he said, give me all you have. <laughs> he thought it was a stick up. <laughs> and he said, oh, no, no. He said, I was just talking back to the devil. 
And so the cab driver watched him in the rearview mirror all the way to his hotel. Didn't keep let his eyes off on him. <laughs> but you know what, folks? We need to concentrate on what we do have and not what we don't have. And sometimes we get like, just like that professor, and we, maybe we don't have $20,000 passed through our hands like he did. But you know what? We're all rich in the Lord. We're all rich in Him. And boy, when our problems come along, no matter what it might be, God's going to teach us something wonderful out of that. Well, I tell you, the things that we've been through these last few months, God has taught us so many things, so many wonderful things. And y'all have been so wonderful to us. And you've shown us in ways in the last couple of months a, a, a love that you have for us that, that we couldn't have ever understood except for the way that you've done. You've given us gifts. You've brought food to the house. Uh, one lady came and brought some women out there to clean the house. I tell you, if y'all are trying to run us off, you're making a mess of it. <laughs> but God just has ways of showing us and teaching us things all through what we go through. So when we face a problem, first of all, let's don't face it in light of our own human resources. Let's figure in the God factor. And then too, when we go through problems, let's realize that God has given us problems to help us to learn deeper, deeper lessons that He wants to teach us. And that our, our problems shouldn't just be seen in the, in, the, in the realm of physical or material. We ought to look in the spiritual realm of it. Now, getting back to something I said just a moment ago about everything that happens to us happens for a reason or a purpose, and maybe we don't know it all now. We'll understand it better by and by, the old song says. Back over in the book of Matthew, where we were this morning, uh, there's a, a something that comes, this, this uh, thing that we're talking about tonight, this, this uh, incident, this event, is in all four Gospels. But in Matthew, there's something about the when they went out on the water. In Matthew 22, it says this. This is right after they've gathered up that, those 12 bags, those 12 uh, baskets of, of fragments. And it says in verse 22, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. Immediately, get that, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. <clears throat> now this is what I, this is this is to help us to see the truth of what we say when we say God's in everything that happens. It was Jesus that immediately made those men get into that boat, wasn't it? And he was the one that sent them out on the water, isn't he? Where did the storm come from? Did he have something to say about where the storm came or not? Yeah, yeah. That storm was completely under his control from start to finish, wasn't it? And so it was, it was Jesus that put them in the midst of that storm. And so what I think we need to see here is that even when we're having problems, don't think of those problems as a curse. Think of them as a blessing. Somehow, in some way, God's got something special to work out in our lives. He, told, he sent those men immediately into that boat and out onto that water and straight into that storm. Now wait a minute. You remember the kind of condition he found them in when he came walking on the water? <laughs> I mean, uh, they were hysterical. I mean, they were, they were out of it. Where They lost it. They thought they were going down, man. I mean, they were, they were dipping water. They, that boat was in serious trouble. They had that old Folgers coffee can. They were dipping that water out the best they could. And I mean, the boat wasn't just in the water, but the water was in the boat, and they were going down, and they were hysterical. They, were, they were, thought they were about to meet their end. See, that, that feeding of the thousands on the shore was the classroom. But the final exam was out in the middle of that storm. Why do you say that, preacher? How many, how many baskets of fragments did they gather up? How many men in the boat? Every one of them had evidence at their feet 
<laughs> they had evidence at their feet that Jesus is sufficient, didn't they? The feeding was the classroom. The real test, the final exam, was out there in that boat. And he had to come again and show them one more time. Friend, listen, the next time you get in to that storm, look around on the floorboard of that boat, will you? Look around at what God's already done. And just imagine He's going to bring another blessing into your life. You know, the, the, the difficult things that we go through, all those things, they grow us spiritually. You remember what He said to Adam? When, when He put Adam out of the garden, He said, the ground is cursed. Remember what He said next? For your sake. For your sake. Didn't He? <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's almost as if God was saying... You had it made in the garden, but I'm going to show you that even with a curse on the ground that I am sufficient for all you need. I'm going to teach you how to trust me. Are you ready? Do you see that? Do you see that? <laughs> and those 12 spies came back and 10 of them said, there's giants in the land. Two of them said, man, they're bread for us. Right? What's bread for? Bread is sustenance. It's, it's what makes you strong. And those giants, in conquering those giants, there's strength in conquering our problems in a spiritual way. And so God's really got something to teach us in everything that comes against us. You remember old Samson was going down the road and a, a lion, a lion got in his path. Amen. Remember that? And the Bible says that old Samson, and I'm not going to go into all this right now, but you, some of you know the way, I, I don't believe Samson... Well, let me say this much. I don't believe Samson looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I, I do not believe that. I don't believe that. I don't think he even looked like Johnny Weissmiller. I don't, I don't think he looked like any of those big old hero kind of guys. I don't think he looked like Rambo. I think he was just an ordinary looking little dude. You know, I think he just a regular looking guy. Because if he looked like those other guys, nobody would wonder where all that strength came from, would they? They'd just say, don't mess with Samson. Don't mess with Samson. Look at him. But the way it was, he just was an ordinary looking guy. But what was the source of his, his strength was the Spirit of God when the Spirit of God came on him. And then the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he grabbed that old lion and he rent him. It says he rent him, just tore him up. The Bible says that the devil is like a roaring lion, doesn't it? You know what that ought to say to us? That ought to say to us that when we're walking in the Spirit of God, even Satan is no match for us. Not in our own power. That lion could have wiped Samson out that quick. Except for one thing, the power of the Spirit of God was on him. <laughs> oh man, listen, we're going we're gonna to face a lot of things this next year. Some challenges. We're going to have some good days. And we're going to have some bad days. Well, what's most important to God? Our ability or our availability? Availability. What's more important to God? Our figuring or our faith? What's more important to God? Our scholarship or our relationship? I think we all know the answer to those questions, don't we? Let's pray together. Well, our Father and our God, we thank You so much that we have Your Word to look to at times like this. And, and when we're sitting together comfortably in a setting like this, in a worship service, an experience of worship, and a time of when we've enjoyed the day just before, and it's so easy for us to come up with the right answers now. But Father, I pray that You'd help us to come up with the right answers when things are not going good. Father, I pray that on the bad days you'll remind us that God is still good. And that maybe our resources are meager, but if we'll just turn over what we have to you, you can do a lot with the little that we have. Father, I thank you that when we face our difficulties and problems, that, that, that we have every reason to think that you've got something in all of that, that we need to look to the spiritual and not just the material and the physical. 
And also, I want to thank you, Lord, that in the midst of all the problems and all the things that we go through, that, that we know that you are sovereign, that you have the storm under your control from the start to the finish. There's not anything too hard for you. And all that you do in us and through us and for us, Lord, it's for your glory and for our good. Now, Lord, I just pray that you'll touch hearts of those that are here tonight in a very special way that only you can by your Spirit. And Father, allow us the privilege of laying down our lives before you again tonight, giving ourselves and all that we have to you again. I pray for those that are here tonight that may have never made the wonderful discovery of knowing Christ personally, that they might come to faith in Jesus tonight. And Father, I pray for those that have other decisions to make, that you'll make those decisions clear in their mind. And then you'll give them the grace and the strength to follow through and not just make the decision, but to follow it through to the end. And we'll give you the glory and the praise for it all in Jesus' name. Would you just stand, please, quietly, head still bowed?